I've been away a while. Um, I've been sick, dreadfully sick, uh, which is why I've been putting out no content. Uh, I have got some new toys. Uh, we've improved some of the production. Uh, so I hope that's coming through. And uh, we've got a pretty decent company to look at today. So let's dive in. Want to know what stocks to buy in 2022? Then rise up, sir, and join the fastest growing online investment club in the UK, achieving over 17% annual average return since 2014. Hey there guys, how's it going? Chris Chinnamov here. Welcome to the FTSE show. This is the show dedicated to the financial analysis of UK FTSE stocks, essentially. Uh, we don't just look at the financials, but they are the primary kind of target of what we're kind of how we're assessing these businesses. Uh, what we're essentially trying to do is identify the stocks that have a good long term share price growth potential. Yeah. Um, so a few things have changed. Uh, we've got this new mic stand thing, um, which just looks a bit more professional, makes it a bit more easier to do. We've got a better lighting rig, which you can't see, but trust me, it's there. It's blinding me right now. Um, we've got these little things here, little stands for the little, um, tablets that I'm using. And you can see here the, uh, annual average return of the 54 stocks that I've identified as part of my membership group. Uh, so if you want to see and track how we're performing, this is 2014 to 2022. So we're at 15.2% annual average return right now. Uh, that is the combined performance of the 54 stocks that I have identified as long-term share growth holders, uh, companies that we're, we're looking to hold. Um, and that incorporates the rubbish that we've gone through in 2022 so far so that should be a lot higher and it will be a lot higher when the markets start to recover but you can track that now we're going to do that every week uh, every episode you can track and see how we're doing uh, so I thought that'd be a nice little addition so yeah we've got a pop shield in because uh, I was getting fed up when editing the videos of hearing myself pop, pop, pop all the time so we put that in hopefully that's going to improve the sound a bit and yeah we're getting there we've got a new plant uh, that wasn't really connected in any way. I just wanted a plant. It's a money tree though. So uh, yeah, anyway, so we're looking at a company today called 888 Holdings. Now 888, you've probably heard of them. Uh, they're relatively well known. This is a, a gambling brand, I suppose. And they have websites, so they're predominantly online, which is a, you know, a lot of the, the way things are going. Um, so they, off, uh, they own several popular gambling brands and websites, including 888 Sport, 888 Casino, and 888 Poker. Uh, founded in May 97, so you know, they don't have a huge history, um, by a couple of Israelis. Um, that's all I know. Uh, does anyone care? Not really. So uh, they started up a website called Casino on Net and Pacific Poker. Uh, which was a USA, a uh, US online poker site, listed on the London Stock Exchange in 2005. Uh, online gambling then became illegal in the US in 2006. I didn't actually, I didn't know that, but um, apparently so. And uh, as a result, they had to close the Pacific Poker website. Uh, they brought everything under the, the 888 brand. I don't know if they, are they AAA or just 888? Probably triple eight, knowing knowing America, but we're going to call them eight 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 because it's more difficult. Uh, <laughs> brought everything under the the eight 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 brand in two thousand and six. Uh, there was a potential merger with Ladbrokes, uh, but it didn't go through due to fears of legal action from the U.S. government in two thousand and seven. In February twenty fifteen, William Hill were looking to take over the company eight 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 for about 750 million, but this was turned down by the company. Then the US allowed online gambling again in 2015. By 2016, the company had 17.8 million customers and a massive surge in revenues due to a increase in mobile phone users. By 2018, they purchased the All American Poker Network. And in 2022, hey, uh, they announced the intention 
to purchase William Hill and all its assets, including the 1,400 UK betting shops, for two billion. So it's swung round, right? So in 2015, William Hill were looking to buy 888 for 750 million. That was turned down. And then fast forward seven years, 888 are now buying William Hill for two billion. So that's pretty big news. That is big news because we're talking about when we go through these financials, when you add William Hill's financials into this, boom, this is a much bigger company, much bigger um, growth, instant growth. And this is what acquisitions can do. They're very exciting. Um, and the, the right acquisitions are so important. If you can, uh, if you're a company and you, you found a, a business that complements what you're doing well, and you can see opportunity to make it better, and it's already profitable, then you're kind of just bolting on extra profits, extra revenue into your business. Um, and it can work really nicely because essentially you don't need all of the same infrastructure that William Hill have. You don't need all the staff. You don't need all the shops and stuff like that. So let's take a look at the vertical analysis then. Let's take a look at the revenue first of all. Revenue has consistently since 2013 been growing. It's been doing very well even during the times of the pandemic. In fact, that is where this company have seen their the most growth. Um, and it kind of makes sense, you know, uh, people stuck at home, people looking for entertainment, people looking for escapism from whatever they'd have to deal with, because it wasn't necessarily just fun and games, right? Uh, and so online gambling, why not? <laughs> uh, so yeah, they saw a lot of increase in, in revenue uh, during those years. But mo more importantly than the short term uh, increase is that they have consistency of growth there. So even back as far as 2013, which was quite some time ago now, uh, we're seeing that this company has been able to find a way to bring more income uh, and make more sales as a business now for at least a decade. So uh, yeah, that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. It looks great to me. Uh, we're going to skip straight to the expenses. The expenses has been growing along with that revenue. Now, there are years there you can see in the red where the, the percentage of expenses relative to the gross profit is a bit too high. Uh, it's colored in red. Uh, it's where the expenses just come in a bit too high as a, as a relation to, to the, the, the gross profit that the company have made, which is essentially the same as the revenue in most cases until 2020, 2021, when their accounting changed and they started to include cost of sales and they broke down expenses and cost of sales in a slightly different way, um, which some companies do. But um, so the kind of end kind of conclusion to this really is that expenses are a little high. They are a bit too high at the moment relative to what I would normally like to see in a company I would be invested in. This wouldn't be enough to put me off and to keep me away, but it is pretty high. Uh, we're looking sort of 2020. We're looking at a company that uh, made 500, 562 million in gross profit and spent 530 million in the expenses of running that business. That's 94%. So that's not going to leave much for profit, right? You're, you're already down to the point where you've only got 32 million operating profit. That's not much to be able to reinvest, to be able to grow that business, to be able to do bigger and better things. We have to take 2020 and 2021 with a pinch of salt though, right? Because it's, it was a weird time for all different businesses. Everyone had to adapt, even companies that were making more revenue. Uh, and so as you can see, expenses definitely jumped up in 2020 and 2021, as well as that additional revenue, uh, which was pretty much commonplace. So yeah, they're doing okay. Um, 2021 was a much better year. You can see they made 111 million and it was actually a record operating profit year for them. So what we can deduce from this is that this company have made consistent profit every single year, which is awesome. Uh, that means a lot, you know, that actually means quite a bit to me that, uh, 
as an investor, I'm looking for a company that can't, aren't just making a profit, but doing so consistently and having proven history of making profit every single year, despite ups and downs, despite lockdowns, despite Brexit, despite invasions of Ukraine. This is a company that have been able to consist, consistently make profit. And you can't say that about the majority of the FTSE. Uh, most companies are, are up and down all over the place. Many are making losses. And this is a company that have been able to be consistently profitable. So I like that. Uh, let's take a look at the earnings analysis then. So taking the operating profit from the previous slide, throwing it to the top. Uh, finance expenses, so essentially interest on debt. We'll take a look at debt in a moment. That's okay. It's not too high. Um, you've got other income there or costs if it's a minus. So we do have 24 million coming out in 2021, probably linked to some sort of lockdown related matter, but I don't know. Um, then we come down to reported profits and essentially the true profits of the business. So what did the actual underlying business make taken away all the extraneous other sources of income that really were like, you know, a sale off their section of their business or selling off certain chunks of assets that they own, but they can't rely upon every single year to to repeat uh what is the taking all that out what is the actual company that they're doing what the, the actual business they run making uh, properly and that is what the true profits essentially are and then the the bottom line where it all kind of wraps in is the profit percentage so what is the percentage of profit the true percentage of profit that they've kept of the uh the revenue that came in and uh, as you can see, they, these guys have had a couple of dicey years where they've only made one or two percent, but consistently sit around the seven to 10 percent mark. Uh, they've even had a couple of years where they've been as high as 16 percent. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, and that is there's going to be a potential amount of uncertainty there for me. Uh, I know companies that are banging in 15, 20, 25 percent a year profit banging it in every year um and so when i see a company like this obviously i have a frame of reference where i'm looking at this and thinking well they're good but i i know there's better um so that's one thing however if we kind of move the stuff i already know aside and just look at this as a potential investment opportunity they're consistently profitable um, it means they're going to have profit left over every year after all costs, essentially, unless something drastic happens. Uh, this is a company that have been operating in that fashion, in that way. Uh, and they seem to be growing every single year and continuing to grow even now. So, And they can run at a, at a profit. So there were some years where any investment uh, into strategic growth may have to slow down because they didn't make enough profit that year. Uh, and so they have to like kind of reel in some of these expenditures into investing in their own growth uh other years they're able to proper go for it because they you know they've made 10 to 15 percent profit that year and so they can spend a bit more lavishly on trying to grow the business um but I like what I see. I like it so far. Let's take a look at the debt analysis. Uh, so we've got our true profits across the top line. We've got short-term borrowings. So any borrowings that they have, any debts they have, they need to be paid back in, within the next year. Uh, and then long-term anything outside of that. Uh, as you can see, from 2021, they've taken on a bit more debt, but it's nothing. I mean, when we look at the earnings-to-debt ratio, this is the ratio of... Uh, debt to the earnings power of this business, we're looking at 0 0.3, which is great. It means that, you know, they're making two true profits of 92 million a year, but they've only got 30 million in outstanding debt, which means essentially what I come down to is, are they biting off more than they can chew? The answer is absolutely not. They could totally pay that off whenever they want. So I've got no concerns over debt whatsoever. Take a look at a net equity analysis then. So taking all of the assets the company owns, that company comes to, as of 2021, 540 million pounds worth of assets. That's property, that's rights, licenses, inventory, if they have any inventory, um, you know, the, the website, all that kind of stuff, uh, all valued to a total of 540 million. Then you've got your liabilities, all of the things that you own that cost you money. Okay, so uh, that could be the, the debt that they have. That could be uh, invoices they haven't paid yet. 
that sort of thing. So these are liabilities added all together. And then if there's anything left over once those liabilities have been paid off, that's your net worth. That's your equity. Uh, their equity sits at 168 in million, essentially. And then they've got the retained earnings at the bottom there. Retained earnings is essentially a pot of money that hasn't been used to pay for acquisitions yet, that hasn't been used uh, to pay for dividends. That is just money left over in the business that they've kind of just held on to. So then we're going to skip to pricing analysis then. So as of doing this, the share price was £1.75. That may have changed by the time you've watched this video. However, at £1.75, these guys are cheap. Now, like I say, things may have changed since uh, I put this video out and obviously you've watched it. Uh, but I would pay as of now, and this, this fluctuates, but as of now, I'd pay up to £2.30 a share for this company. So we're not looking at the company as should you invest in this company? All I'm saying is the price is the price right. It's not not if the, is the investment right, but is the price right? Forget the investment. Is the price right for for what you're getting in this business in terms of earnings power, in terms of their value, in terms of um, their equity. For £1.75, you're getting quite a lot. And actually, I'd be prepared to pay up to £2.30 a share and consider that cheap. I'd go as far as paying £2.70 a share and saying that's a fair price. I'd go as far as £3.10 per share and say I'm stretching it, but I'd be willing to pay it. Over £3.10, I'd say no, I'm not interested. It's just getting too much. But we're well away from that. We've got quite a bit of movement there. So as of now, I'd say 888 share price um, if you're looking at a share price that's under two pounds seventy, up to three pounds, it's good value. It's a good it's a good price. Um, dividend in 2020 they paid a 15 pence per share dividend. That actually would work out about eight percent yield right now. So again, that's a pretty decent dividend. Can't argue with that. Um, however, no dividend in 2021 due to the William Hill purchase, and we'll come to that in a moment. So quick roundup of this company then. So we've got a slow growth. It's not a particularly fast growing company. You know, I've seen companies that are growing at sort of 15, 20% a year and they're just flying. And you look at the share price and it's literally just flying. Uh, 888 are a bit more slower, but they are consistent. And that does mean a lot. Uh, so we're looking about 2% revenue growth per year up until 2019. Uh, it then picked up quite a bit in the last couple of years in terms of that growth speed. Inconsistent profit margins of between 3 and 16% per year. Uh, and they've had one losing year in 2011, and it was only just a losing year. Uh, you could almost call it break even. Uh, a £2 billion acquisition of William Hill announced in 2022, currently in progress. Things are literally happening with that as we speak. So, There'll be news coming out over the next few days on that, I suspect. Uh, financed by two billion of debt. So they don't have a ton of money sitting in the background to be able to put into this. They're going to be taking on two billion of debt to finance this. So that's important to understand because, yes, you're going to have more revenue coming in from William Hill. Yes, you're going to be making profit from William Hill, but that profit's going to be offset by debt. Right. So the debt that you're borrowing, the uh, repayments you're going to have to make every year are going to be offset against that profit that's coming in. Plus, the interest on that debt is going to be added to the liabilities that you're going to have to take off that profit that's coming in. So we might see more revenue. We might see um, more. We're going to definitely see more expenses. And as a result, profit might not change that much in the business. Therefore, the profit percentage is going to fall. However, long term, every year they're going to be paying off a chunk of that debt. Every year, those uh, that interest on that debt is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller because the debt's going to uh, fall. They're going to renegotiate terms on that debt. They're going to get lower interest rates. These companies, they know what they're doing. Uh, and as a result, they'll slowly be able to maximize that profit. So short term, we might not see anything super exciting in terms of profit. But what they would do is over the years of paying off that two billion in debt, they're going to slowly maximize their profit. So uh, when they start releasing their finance financial reports after this takeover of William Hill, 
uh, we would expect to see profits going higher and higher as the debt goes down lower and lower. The same is going to happen with the equity as well, the equity in the business. The uh, assets are going to be huge. The liabilities are now going to be huge, but those liabilities will slowly ebb down year after year as they pay off that debt. So you're going to see equity grow. You're going to see profit grow probably so that's exciting because that then if you're looking at holding a company for 10 15 20 years that's what you want so that's interesting uh the acquisition is expected to go through in june 2022 the board have actually said they expect the acquisition to be immediately earnings enhancing so essentially they're expecting that to enhance their profits immediately so it might not be as exciting as it first seems but they're saying profit's going to go up pretty much from the very, very beginning. So that's cool. I'm taking a quick look at William Hill then because I feel that's quite an important addition to this. Uh, their 2021 financials reported $1.24 billion in revenue. So that's what new revenue is probably going to be coming in to 888 as a result of this acquisition. They made $164 million in pre-tax profit in 2021. That was about 13%. So this is a healthy, profitable business, William Hill, that they would be acquiring and bringing in to the 888 brand. Uh, they'd be adding 164 million in profit, but obviously they'd be taking also be taking on the debt repayments and the interest on those debt, debt repayments, which will offset a big chunk of that profit, I'm sure. Uh, but what they're saying, the board are saying, is that it probably won't take up all of it. So it will actually enhance the profits from year one. Um, William Hill revenues up 7%. Profits were up 10% on their 2020 results. So things looking really healthy for, for William Hill. This looks like a, a good acquisition. It's extremely complementary to what they're doing. It's not like they're trying to change... Uh, or move into a completely different segment. They're just acquiring one of their competitors, essentially, and bringing them on board. Um, only the William Hill online business is making a profit. So I looked into this. I've done some analysis on William Hill. And when you dig deep, deep into the financials, you'll see that William Hill's online business is making a profit. Their retail stores are not. They don't make any profit from the William Hill stores you see out there. Um, that's really interesting. In fact, the retail side of William Hill is loss making and it's cost them 26 million in 2021. Uh, the year before that it cost them 40 million in 2020, although that's likely to be connected to the lockdowns. So what I'm half expecting might happen here is that with 888 being a online only business, we'll probably get rid of these stores. I've got a sneaky feeling that's what's going to happen. I've got a sneaky feeling you'll stop seeing any William Hill retail stores out there because they're loss making. So why carry on? Why, why not get rid of them? 888 are online only already. So are they going to take on retail stores that are making a loss of 26 million? To me, that wouldn't make business sense. To me, it makes more sense that 888 take William Hill as an online brand uh, they keep the William Hill website probably, but it'll be owned by 888. They will continue with the online business that's making a profit and they'll just cut off the retail stuff and they'll cut off the staff. What that immediately does is that makes William Hill as an entity more profitable because you're getting rid of a lot of expenses. You're getting rid of the entire retail line. You can sell off all the property. You can sack off all the staff, which I know is a moral issue. Um, but from a business point of view only, it makes sense. And I can see 888 doing that and making the whole thing even more profitable for themselves. So expect that. I'm, I'm certainly expecting that. So let's take a look at the leaderboard then. So straight away, you can see here 888, they fly into second place. A uh, few people on the comments have been saying, can we see a company that get a positive, clean score? Listen, when I look at these companies, I don't pick them based on their clean score for the show. I pick them almost at random. We then do the show, we do the analysis, then we do the show on the analysis. And then, so, so as a result of that, it's just almost like a, a, a lucky draw, I suppose. Um, so I'm not orchestrating the way this leaderboard is, is building. Uh, but they've slid in there at 61 points, second place. It's good to have another company in there that are worth 
keeping a close eye on. I love the price. Price makes sense to me. The acquisition of William Hill is very exciting. Is this a company I would personally get involved with? No, personally not. Um, And that's only personal preference. That's just preference. I I get how the business works. I get how it operates. Um, It kind of makes sense. It seems to be a highly profitable business. Um, It's just not something I'm particularly interested in uh, as an investor. But if it's something that, you know, appeals to you, I would say they look like a decent investment. I'd say they're a decent holding. Uh, And I think the most appealing aspect of it right now is the fact that there is some real growth potential over the next 10, 15, 20 years with the William Hill acquisition. Uh, I can see them growing well as they pay off that two billion in debt. I think it's a hell of a lot of debt to take on, but over time, if they can maintain their profitability to be able to pay that off, then things will just get better and better. And um, yeah, the price right now, I don't know what today's price is for you right now watching this, but if it's under sort of three pounds a share, uh, I like it. Um, and as of, as of time of recording this, we're looking at one pound seventy five a share, which is a steal. So yeah, I would you know seriously consider them. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I hope this has been useful. I hope to see you again in the next episode. Thanks for watching. 